Warning. The following episode contains subject matter and scenes that some viewers may find upsetting, disturbing, or unnerving. Please note, viewer discretion is advised at all times. Sit back and enjoy. She was quite small and she had natural uh, golden hair and she was very kidnappable. I can't help, I'm a single fella. There's nothing wrong with it, you haven't broken any laws, have you? None whatsoever. The police currently have eight formal allegations against Sir Jimmy Savile, two of rape and six of indecent assault. But they say information is coming in all the time. Hospitals have rules with patients and things like that. Well, because I'm dyslexic when I want to be. I don't understand rules. Very real, very sad story. The Metropolitan Police and the NSPCC painted a picture of abuse on an almost industrial scale. I have an enormous respect for people. First of all, I'm a rare breed insofar as I'm a single fella, uh, but my game was not to have one wife, to have a thousand. The BBC Director General George Entwistle apologised to victims of alleged sex abuse by Sir Jimmy Savile and promised to hold an internal inquiry after the police investigation. I never brought any harm to anybody. And I never thought there was a profit in, in being bad. So I had a bit of fun at nobody's expense. I'm feared in every girls' school in this country. If I arrive at the gates of heaven and St Peter says, you've been a very tricky man, you can't come in here. I'll break his thumbs. Strange to them, not strange to me. I quite enjoy being me, and it's good fun, and that's the name of the game. Good fun. And welcome back to I Could Murder, a podcast episode number six. Traditionally, the finale of the series. Yes, it um, is, Ben, but we're this time. No, 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 no. Double up. D- double bounce. I said that it's going to be a double bounce. We're going to do a special double bounce. Yeah, but we everyone agreed in the comments that double bounce means nothing. Before we start, don't forget to subscribe to the channel um, or follow us on any of our socials. At Could Murder A Pod. Um, if you do want to support us and also get a little cheeky discount in our uh, merch store, then please uh, head over to patreon.com forward slash Could Murder A Pod to find all of your exclusive Patreon content. We've got a whole host of uh, episodes up there now, some very interesting little minisodes. For those that are listening, we are also a visual platform. So any episode you like and you've listened to, uh, why not treat yourself to a little YouTube watch? Because you can see us in person. We put up lots of funny and sometimes not so funny uh, visuals. Feel free. It's it's a different experience. Yeah. I mean, speaking of visuals, this this week's case, um, we were spoiled for choice in terms of the uh, the mugshot kind of image we could use. So we we, we talk about what we want to use for our thumbnail. And uh, there were too many to choose from that looked terrifying yes Uh, this week's case is of course it's jimmy savile yeah i mean how did you find uh the research for 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 this particular case savile was one which before we began even doing it i thought that's because it spans such a long time Mm -hmm. it was going to be one where it it could easily be over a couple episodes and there's lots of moments throughout the timeline and throughout the case which you think how didn't they Spot this a lot earlier on. Yeah, I mean, I remember it coming out at the time. I remember all the awful headlines, all of the uh, you know additional victims that came forward. Some victims perhaps even haven't come forward to this day. Yeah. Um, but I, I never truly appreciated the extent of just how much awful activity he was able to to get away with and manipulate his way through. I think it's just the fact that how many rumours there were about about him and how they were never really thoroughly fo- followed up is yeah. the kind of the big the big thing of this as well. So we're going to have a look through his childhood and his adolescence and see how he got to this extreme power in society, which is... Yeah, it, definite rags to riches story. It really you is. Can't take but, that away from him. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very bizarre how the friends he made in the high places. But yeah, we'll, we'll get onto that and we'll start off with his kind of humble beginnings. Okay, so James Wilson Vincent Savile was born on October 31st, 1926 in Leeds, a Halloween baby. He was the youngest of seven children um, and he was self-described as an old child. Kind of reminds me of 
Carl Pilkington. I think he Savile has been old forever. Yes. In all his pictures when he's young, he just looks old. In his mid thirties, he looks like he's in his late sixties. He looks like I've drawn him. <laughs> that was did, good. Yeah. Arthur did a drawing of him now. Yeah. So uh, he was the youngest of seven children in in uh, a, a very. Uh, devout Roman Catholic family, um, which was headed by his father, Vincent Joseph Mary Savile, um, who was a bookmaker's clerk and also worked as an insurance agent, although uh, betting at the time was illegal, so it was very kind of behind closed doors. Um, And his mother, who Savile would later refer to as the Duchess, um, we'll get on to that shortly, uh, Agnes Monica Savile. um, A lot of middle names they've got. Yeah, a lot of kids, a lot of names, uh, very confusing at Christmas. I imagine it is, Ben. Uh, The family lived in a small terraced house and it was not uncommon for the family to gather around the fire to keep warm, but also to gather around the piano while Agnes played. Sometimes they burnt the piano. Yes. Two birds, one stone. Hot keys. She was very good (laughs) at the piano. She was very good. I was trying to think what it possibly could have meant, but it literally didn't mean anything. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, please. Okay. Sometimes it's just good to be straightforward and simple. Yeah. This was all going on during the Great Depression. So, you know, big family in a small house, not uncommon. Um, dad was away working a lot. Um, he actually introduced Jimmy, or we'll, we'll, we'll call it, well, how did he go by Jimmy? The same as James. Well, I know that, but at a point did he start going, oh, Jimmy? Well, my brother's called James and he calls himself Jim. Jim. Yeah. James and Jamie, so similar. No, different. Um, Sometimes people abbreviate their names. Yeah, okay. Well, the, <coughs> Benjamin, Ben, Thomas, Tom, Daniel, Dan. So uh, Jimmy grew up during uh, the Great Depression. Um, he was introduced to cigar smoking by his father at the tender age of seven. That is very odd. Yeah, yeah. Well, something, very odd. something to do. Get, just get a football, kick it about. Yeah. That's that also, Cheaper. Yeah. Yes. Savile grew up during the Great Depression and later claimed, I was forged during the crucible of want. He described his father as scrupulously honest, but scrupulously broke. So times were not good in the uh, the Savile household. So when Jimmy was a teenager, um, he worked as a Bevan boy in, yeah. in the mines. And basically Bevan boy worked there to increase the rate of coal production. Um Really big tangent, but how they how they picked Bevan boys was they uh, Bevan was the last name of the person who introduced this idea, and they'd pick numbers out of a hat, and then anyone's uh, national insurance number which ended with those numbers would have to be involved in being a Bevan boy. Wow. Uh, anyway, so Bevan boys would work down the mines to help increase the rate of coal production, and yeah, Jimmy Savile was one was that at the age of fourteen, but reportedly sustained sustained a spinal injury. Yeah, multiple spinal injuries we've heard, but from a shot firer's explosion. Ooh. As well as this, in his teen years, um, he, he found a slight interest in care homes um, and hospitals and people that had been injured. And uh, it was not uncommon again for, for Jimmy to um, be seen on the wards or in various care homes. And he would occasionally uh, try and sneak beer to the older residents and older uh, patients in the hospital. So he'd get a fairly good reputation with the people in the hospital, not obviously the staff, but the the patients and the... Um, it's a very odd thing to yeah get fascinated with and, and want to do. Yeah, I think he was essentially wanting to make people feel better, um, I, I assume. Mm. Um, but he, yeah, he would sneak beer onto the wards. I think there's probably a sinister undertone to that as like all his charity work. There's, it's mm. a case of what, that he would be getting something out of it. I can't see him doing it off his own. Mm. Jimmy would go on to say of his mother later on in life that um, she never got round to being proud of him. Um, if anyone asked her what Jimmy is like, she would say, I don't know what he's up to, but he's up to something. She never trusted me as she thought I was going to get nicked and end up in the pokey. The pokey? So, uh, yeah, he, so as we said, um, it was a very kind of strict household, but, but he did put his mother on quite the pedestal. Yeah. Um, and like from the sound of things there, he, he he probably in his eyes was always constantly after, you know, her being proud of him and, and the admiration from her. The last born, six other siblings vying for her attention. It's a tough enough, tough enough to get a good view of the piano. So uh, he would remain as a Bevan boy until uh, his late teens, uh, wherein then he'd move on to uh, a new role as a scrap metal dealer. 
Um, so kind of stuck at that for a couple of years. And uh, and then he found his first true passion after cigars. So in an interview, um, Jimmy would go on to say, what are the things that make me happy in life? And what can I find that is a, is a thing that links all those together and can be my job? So I got a piece of paper, literally a piece of paper and a pen. And I'm like, what do I like? Stopping in bed of the morning, uh, girls, uh, warmth, uh, fitted carpets, coloured lights, the most impossible list you ever saw in your life, right? And I looked at that and thought, what on earth sort of job? Then I thought, hang on, I've just described a dance hall. He went straight up to the place, he blagged his way in, probably from the scrap days, had a gift of the gab a little bit, mm -hmm. he blagged his way in and he ended up kind of growing very quickly in that environment and... and, and uh, he would run multiple different locations. Mm. Just started sneaking in beers to everybody. I mean, he's dance dancehall, so they sell beer. Well, yeah, but he's giving them away for free. Well, that'd be a terrible business. He wouldn't, he wouldn't grab the lad. Like Could that. make a lot of friends though in the right places. But, and I think he already did because he's already exceed, you know, exceeding expectations of anything. He's running. We the don't know if the beers were there or not. The beers were there. I've seen receipts. <laughs> and invoice numbers. So Savile began playing records in various dance halls across Leeds in the early 1940s and he actually made a bold claim to have been the first DJ to use two turntables and a microphone. Yeah, twin turntables, some people call them. Oh, twin T's. No, no one calls it that. Twin, term, twin turntables <laughs> to keep the music playing, constantly playing, but this has been disputed that it wasn't actually him was actually uh, disputed due to the fact that twin turntables were illustrated in the BBC handbook of 1929 and advertised for sale in Gramophone magazine in 1931. There you go. Another passion of uh, Jimmy's was sports. Um, he, he loved to run, he loved to cycle, and he also loved to wrestle. Yes, he did indeed. Um, he was quite an up and coming, and the uh, the promoters backed him. They wanted him yeah. to do well, and they'd they'd warn other wrestlers about him. They basically wanted them to get Jimmy over, lose to him, and kind of see him exceed. But there was a, a wrestler of the time uh, who was next coal miner called Exotic Adrian Street, who wasn't very impressed when he was told to lose to Jimmy. And this is a direct quote from him, which is great. I kicked his legs from underneath him, so he hit the deck. Then I picked him up by his hair, held him upside down, and dropped him on in the skull. Then, well done to that man. Then when I looked down at my hands, I realised they were covered in hair, savils. I torn huge clumps out of his scalp. I absolutely crucified the bloke, and when I spoke to my wife afterwards, she said I looked like a hungry fox going after a chicken. Savile never returned to the wrestling ring again after that, and I never clapped eyes on him again. So Savile would later say uh, around his... Uh, uh, ventures into different sports if you look at the athletics of it I've done over 300 professional bike races 212 marathons and 107 pro fights um, he proudly announces that he lost all 35 of his first ones no wrestler wanted to go back home and say they lost to a long haired disc jockey and put him down so from start to finish I got a good hiding I've broken every bone in my body and I love it but the SDS odd even with a uh... We've seen him doing his mar many marathon runs. He doesn't look like a guy, especially with his diet, because his diet was terrible as well. Yeah. And then again, in the interview I refer referred to earlier, he talks about the kind of stuff he eats, which essentially was bread and dripping, pork pies, and he doesn't eat yet. Don't like putting anything in my mouth, that's too good for me. <laughs> that was actually a good impression as well. That was very good, yeah. <laughs> um, Fucking chill. And so he able to do so much sport and be good at it, especially how many cigars he was smoking since the age of seven, yeah. and let alone what that piano smoke must have done to his lungs. Well, famously, he was on a treadmill while uh, Louis Farouk was interviewing him with a cigar in his mouth. So whilst working in the dance halls in Ilford Mecca Dance Hall, uh, Savile was discovered by music executive from Decca Records. Decca was down at the Mecca? Yeah, Decca down the Mecca. Wow, there you go. With the twin Deccas. Was Savile in his speckers? What does that mean? Oh, <laughs> He looked, yeah, yeah. quite good. Savile's first television role was a presenter of Tyne T's television music programme, Young at Heart, mm. which aired from May 1960. Although the show was black and white, he was quite a zany character, especially for the time. He would dye his hair yeah. every week. Even, different colours. Even though it was a black and white TV. Often turn up in some very interesting different attire. Yes, he, he, he on TV and with his, with his style, he was very much, you know, 
trying to make himself a bit of a cartoon character. I don't know yeah. if that was a, he, he obviously was it an attention to, thing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. He, he wanted to be remembered. It's, it's like I remember back in the day playing football. They'd say if you go for a trial, if you wear Larry boots, people would be like remember you better with oh the kid with the pink boots. The crazier clothes he wore, the more memorable he was, and the more kind of uh, different. Yeah, mm. and hidden in plain sight is a thing very much that applies to him throughout his life as well. A lot of things he says and does, and he as if he's not hiding anything. Like he's he's trying to draw so much attention to him. Weirdly, people then just kind of turn a blind eye at things. So he would continue uh, to present a young at heart, and then in 1964 he would present the first edition of Top of the Pops. So Top of the Pops was a show um, uh, focused on music charts at the time, um, and they would have different top talents from throughout the world uh, perform on the show. Yes, and like a lot of, it would go on to be kind of the hub of where presenters, presenters if presenters were on top of the pops or uh, appeared on there, it usually went on to do quite big things. Jimmy Savile, yeah, the first person on it. In fact, he even presented the last top of the pops as well. Yeah. So while Savile was presenting the top of the pops, he would maintain the desire to kind of look a little bit different, look a little bit out there. Um, and again, to go back to your football trial, um, he, he was wanting to grow his career and move on to bigger and better things. So um, would be constantly trying to attract new and different bits of attention. Essentially peacocking. He, he always wear elaborate clothing. And that was, as we said, he's kind of like a living cartoon character, which... In, that in itself, you know, he was very larger than life, mm -hmm. and he was even used to front a uh, public uh, information broadcast. Nag yourself to remember this drill. Clunk the car door and click the seatbelt. Clunk, click every trip. Which is promoting um, people using seatbelts, and that was very much kind of aimed towards children. They saw Savile as the guy who could uh, speak to the children in regards to kind of this message, which just shows how famous he was and how they, you know, a safe pair of hands for this um, promotion. So at the time, Savile's look was regarded as an eccentric adornment to British public life, which could be disputed there, I think. But he would often uh, be uh, cigar dawning um, and frequently was spoofed for his dress sense, which usually featured a tracksuit or a shell suit. Um, and gold jewellery, excessive gold jewellery. Um, he also had uh, his own range of uh, licensed fancy dress uh, costumes. So during the height of uh, Savile's fame, he was approached by a producer who wanted to have a word with Jim and said, Jim, you're always fixing things. We want to put some pictures to it. So that's where Jim will fix it, the TV show came about. Essentially, children would write in their millions to the show, mm -hmm. having dreams of maybe performing with the Osmonds or feeding a llama. And uh, Jim will basically Make fix it for you to happen. happen. Yeah. yeah, and it's not, it, you know, whereas today you have things like Make-A-Wish, it was it was just any any request would be welcome and he would make anything happen for anyone. Apparently they'd put in a big barrel all the letters and randomly pick it out and, and uh, Savile said the reason why it was so successful was they weren't just picking, in his words, the most beautiful or the best talking child, they would just have any person on the show It's for anybody. My question for you, Ben, actually, was if... <laughs> Obviously, if, let's ignore, try you're and ignore not, everything else. What would you want him to fix for you oh. as a kid? Not now, because as a kid, that would be gross. Um, was a big fan of the Chuckle Brothers as a kid, but got to see them live. So I don't you saw them too, live? Yeah, saw them live, yeah. What did they do? Uh, I can't remember. Memorable show? Yep. Uh, I, got, I think it was even mine or my brother's birthday, so we got a shout out at the end. It was like pantomime type thing. To me, to you, to Ben! Yeah, that was. I think that was the. Probably was. Right? It's all coming back to me now. To me, to. Has it, has, has, yeah, it's a good show. Good show. Um, if Jim could fix anything for me as a kid, oh, made it worse. He did sound worse when you said it. Weirdly, uh, but what, <laughs> what would you? Was there any bands you liked? Do you want to go? Um, oh, I remember. Well, this is weird actually, but we're here. Um, do you remember? Um, you're a big fan of Gary Glitter growing up, weren't you? No, that's not. Okay. That's irrelevant. Um, and I wasn't. Um, <laughs> do you remember... Um, so unclear. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember um, Halle Berry's character from the Flintstones? Yes, I do, yeah. Yeah. The the secretary. Yeah. Um, <laughs> How old are you and what's this? Really young. That's the, that's my point. It was... Um, Flintstones by what? No. Dan, can you check what, what the uh, year Flintstones was, please? Hmm. Okay. Carry on. Got me Carry on the story. Well, just uh, <laughs> would have been nice to have said, you know, for a young me to go onto the set of the Flintstones and meet the cast. 
So you want them to reshoot it because you've seen the film. Yeah, it's you, been out for you. Well, I don't know what year it came 94, out in. 94. 94. Okay. That's, no, it was five. So you, a five-year-old Ben wanted to go on the go on the set. Just go on the set to ogle, with Halle Berry. To and, ogle um, Halle Berry. Okay. Yeah, five. That seems... Maybe I saw it a few years after it came out. Even then, that's not okay. Mm, yeah, I feel uncomfortable. So thank you. <laughs> Um, it, so yeah, no, Jim can fix what was already broken. <laughs> <laughs> so that show would be one of the, you know, the main draws, the main events. He was becoming the, one of the biggest stars. It's hard to kind of think of anyone nowadays. It's like Anton Deck times 10. He, he was so well known. Yeah, um, be 20 of them. So, yeah. <laughs> With his rise in fame, he would also do a lot of charity work for particular charities. It always seemed to be the char charities which were the most well known. So you could get kind of, it seemed to be a bit of a play to get more celebrity and more um, recognition for doing it. Yeah, at the same time, whilst doing all of this for these charities, he still wanted something back for himself, I guess, in terms of this, uh, you know, this rise in his uh, his, his celebrity stardom, but also uh, in in the. Um, you know, behind the scenes, he was making friends in very high places. Yes. I mean, Jeremy Forward, he would go on to set up a couple of his own charities, the Jimmy Savile Stoke Mandeville Hospital Trust in 1981, and also the lead space Jimmy Savile Charitable Trust in 1984. Raised millions. Absolutely. How much was it in total? 40 odd? I think 30 million it was, Ben. That's, that's a lot of money. That is a lot of money. I don't remember too much of him as a kid. Like, I don't remember watching any of Jim. I was too busy watching the Flintstones. Apparently. I don't think it was on when we were kids. Yeah, I don't remember any of that. The first time I really yeah, became... it wasn't on. <laughs> it's like, I don't, I don't remember the war. <laughs> um, no, so yes, yeah, so for me, the first time I really watched anything that he was on, it was when Louis Farouk interviewed him, made the, the, when Louis met. Yeah, so actually, uh, my mum got a Jimmy Savile autograph when she was younger. Uh, yeah, little girl and uh, she remembers being in the car um, I think the, the, it had a backward facing kind of uh, seats or she was looking over the back seat Jimmy was driving in his Bentley behind them and she, he was waving at her very eerie she went on yeah. to sell the uh, autograph after everything came out yeah um, I can't remember how much it was for but yeah it was very uh, dis, very dis, yeah horrible thought <clears throat> so while Jimmy's stock is rising and um, he's doing a lot of charity work um, he's on you know two or three different shows at the same time um, he appears twice on This Is Your Life um, which was a very very famous British show where they basically get the biggest celebrities on and they analyse Think certain interesting events of this their is, past this is your teacher from back in 1965 yeah, there you go Ooh. yeah just that as in general yeah. not not wouldn't work time wise with him. This was another Bevan boy. <laughs> this was uh, the wrestler. Um, Adrian. Hmm. Exotic Fox. Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> this is exotic Adrian. This is your piano from when you were a kid. <laughs> Someone get a fire extinguisher. So he was twice the subject of This Is Your Life, once in 1970 and once again in 1990. So as well as this, he would also make a very infamous appearance on Dr. Anthony Clare's radio series in The Psychiatrist's Chair. Do you think they called it that because of the rhyme or do you think that's just purely quinky dink? <clears throat> I, I don't know, Dr. Anthony Clare's Psychiatrist. That's how they originally pitched it and they thought that was going to catch on. Yeah, so they called it Psychiatrist Chair. <laughs> Claire would go on to conclude that he was a man without feelings. There is something chilling about this 20th century saint, which he concluded in the published transcript of the interview. So yeah. obviously someone in a position where they're able to analyse people properly, they've come up with that kind of... In 1992, they've come up with this something, you know, not quite uh, right with this guy. So Savile's stock continues to rise, and he's now, you know, one of the most famous people in the country. He's got um, audiences with... Royalty, so he's good friends with Princess Diana, Prince Charles, um, uh, politicians. Margaret Thatcher was said to have been a huge fan, um, and then he he even gets to the point where he now um, puts him in a position to have an audience with the Pope. Yeah, so he he would even he would spend Christmas Christmas days with Margaret Thatcher. He would even mediate Prince Charles and Lady Di's divorce. So yeah. he was so involved in it there's this letter from prince charles to him saying he didn't know if he was his advisor or was he a close friend and jimmy said i'm all i'm all the above it's just as a car like as we said he's larger than life he's like a kind of cartoon character he doesn't yeah. seem like 
it seems like it'd be annoying at a dinner party. Yeah. I don't know how he's getting in with all the politicians of these people who have such power. Well, it's, I mean, to raise 40 million for charity over yeah. however many years, it, that's quite a feat yeah. in itself. And um, obviously he is different. He's quirky. He's off the wall. It's like that movie when they invite people to parties to, what's that? Party? Dinner of schmucks. Yeah. But was, I don't think that's what they're doing to him, though. No, no. Now, you think you've got a big idiot. I've got, come in. Wait until you see now this now <laughs> Oh, there's the, what's that smoke? Is that the piano? No, it's not a cigar. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it, I just find it baffling. How, well, I mean, he's he's risen through the uh, the ranks and everything he's done extremely quickly. Yeah. Um, it's it's quite, and he's obviously done that in the political sense as well. I mean, he's no idiot. He he's a, he was a member of Mensa. <laughs> yes. So he's yeah. incredibly intelligent as well. Well, that's it. And if you if you remove the hindsight of what is currently going on and was going on and and all of that stuff. He he was charming. He was able to manipulate people. He was be able to befriend people. He did have power as well. And patter. And patter. Power patter. Now then. So um, as well as all these friends in extremely high places, um, he would also go on to then make, uh, again, infamous appearances on Have I Got News For You, uh, When Louis Met. So Louis Farouz, uh, was that part of his Weird Weekend series? Yeah, it was, yeah. Which is now hard to find, but luckily I've got the DVD. He also appeared on Celebrity Big Brother, which I'd forgotten all about, uh, in 2006, so in Series 4. Um, it, it, it had mixed reviews. Yeah, he went on there to fix it for certain housemates, essentially. Yeah. He also uh, returned to television in 2007 after a long absence with Jim Will Fix It Strikes Again. That's where he would get the people he fixed it for before would come on and then have a chat about the kind of ev events and everything that he did with them. The House of the Llama. He died after shooting Jimmy. <laughs> um, he would say, though, in interviews, he always saw himself as, as always relevant. Even though it seems like there's, time, there's times when he would disappear, he was like, oh, you know, with reruns and whatnot, I'm always on the telly, I'm always doing things, always doing... And like, he was always doing things like charity work. Yeah, in the Lou hospitals. In, and in the Louis Theroux documentary, even, he... You know, he hurt his leg and it was front page news, but it seemed to be like he leaked that story out because he wanted to be, yeah. he still wants to be known in it. And talking about the Louis Theroux documentary, there was some very telling moments within that, yeah. um, which now Louis reflects on. And he's even done a, a follow up documentary and um, because of because of these things. Um, Savile would say in the documentary, we live in a very funny world. and It's easy for me as a single man to say I don't like children because that puts a lot of salacious tabloid people off the hunt. Which, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was the first real thing I'd watched before everything came out on with Savile in it. Yeah. And I, I found it then there were some odd moments. And obviously, in hindsight, you'd know straight away which points to pick up. But yeah, even like, then, there were... He, sorry, he'd go on to say about the dance halls, that he used to beat people up and lock them in a basement during his career as my club <clears> manager. <throat> Yes, yeah, so he said he said that he this would be guys that were starting trouble in the nightclubs. So he'd tie them up in the basement, beat... Essentially, him and his friends would beat them up. When the police then came to say, Jim, you're being a bit too rough here, or what's going on here, he would turn around and say, well, well I know that your 15-year-old daughter comes here. Do you want her to be safe with me or not? Yeah. And that's kind of his first taste, um, looking back all those years, at kind of he power he, he, over police. Exactly. He's able to turn the tables and, and use his power. And they're like, oh, no, Jimmy, fair play, fair play. And he's able yeah. to manipulate it in a way where he's like, yeah, he's, he's looking out and look, leave it with me or, or something will happen to you. Um, and as you mentioned, with they have got news for you. I'm feared in every girl's school in this country. <laughs> so after he makes this comment on Have I Got News For You, there's there's laughter you hear immediately. And to people who are just watching it casually, they'll think, oh, that, that's the crowd laughing. But it's definitely canned laughter. Um, yeah. And also you can see from the faces of the other people on the panel that they're very stony faced. It kind of goes on to, you start thinking maybe, you know, because a lot of people did hear rumours about Jimmy. So... Maybe they'd heard things themselves, um, but you can see from the faces they weren't willing to laugh at that joke. Yeah. He's also uh, a, a life member of the British Gypsy Council, um, uh, becoming the first outsider to have been made a member in their history. <clears throat> Following on from him, you know, doing all this charity work and, and helping build hospitals and whatnot, he was awarded the OBE in 1971 and was knighted in 1990. He was very much within, in with the royals, with Charles and Princess Diana, and, um, you know, they gave him these uh, accolades, which, to the public, you know, it, he's, you know, the famous guy from TV who's done all these great things. It, it was seen as, you know, it makes a lot of sense him being given these uh, accolades. So at this point, uh, we're going to go into the timeline. Um, as Tom mentioned at the start of the episode, it's you know it's, it's spanning fifty years, um, so there's lots of different times. But we're going to kind of try and summarise each 
key event as we can uh, to make it nice and concise. So in 1955 was the first incident recorded by police about Jimmy Savile, which took place in Manchester during the time he managed a dance hall. So in 1960, in one of a handful of example cases given by the police, a 10-year-old boy asked Savile for his autograph outside of a hotel he was staying in. Savile took the young boy inside and sexually assaulted him. 1965 records show abuse started at the BBC and at Leeds General Infirmary, where Savile was a long-term volunteer porter. And at Stoke Mandeville Hospital, where he also volunteered. Yeah. These... It's surely, like, the thing is, obviously charity work, I get it, and volunteering, and people do do that, and even famous people do do that. But it's, it's just the access he has. It's just bizarre that, like, a, you know, volunteering to be a porter and left to your own devices, that kind of thing obviously would, would never kind of happen today. But, yeah, like you said, it's, he's... he's He's been in these places where they're very vulnerable people. I mean, yeah. at, at this stage, 1965, a lot of stories haven't emerged about yeah. him. So they're just thinking, oh, this is a very nice separate. They want to do these nice things. But yeah. when you look back on it, it just starts, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, as part of this, I, I read some of the official NHS investigation transcripts into these incidents and what he would do is he'd be known as the man with the white hair or the man with the silver hair because he would constantly be changing it. But he'd essentially be walking around the hospital in full kind of doctor's gowns scrubs but i can't think of few more terrifying sights than jimmy savile in a doctor's gown <laughs> well i can you can think of one more horrific sight than that but even then what was that one it was without the gown oh. 1966 this was the start of what police have identified as savile's peak period for abuse so to even have enough of a period to peak um, which lasted a decade Allegations include abusing young patients at Stoke Mandeville Hospital, molesting a brain-damaged girl at Leeds General Infirmary, and assaulting a 12-year-old boy at a Leeds children's home. So in 1970, records show Savile started to abuse girls at Duncroft Girls' School, which was a school for intelligent but emotionally disturbed girls. He was a regular visitor there, and he would go on to abuse a lot of the students there. Yeah, so a lot of the students that were there at the time would be in the second uh, Louis Ferrou documentary on Savile and some, a lot of the other documentaries as well that we saw and essentially he would start to kind of uh, uh, turn up in his Rolls Royce um, offer to help out on the ground site as kind of the handyman that he was and then he would pick a couple of girls to go out with him and go for a drive. So according to one of the victims he would take them out, it would be a treat day but then he would go on to lose control of his hands with the, uh, the underage girls in the car. So in 1972, in another example of Savile's offences police uh, have listed, he is recorded as groping a 12-year-old boy and his two female friends who were all in attendance of a filming of Top of the Pops. And I mean, there are various bits of footage uh, from his Top of the Pops days where you can see him in a crowd because what they like to do is kind of uh, zoom in or zoom out on the presenters in with the audience while music was playing. But there are a couple of really horrible clips where you can see like girls either like kind of jump up that is what you can't see where Savile's hands are and um and uh, it, apparently it wasn't you know just females that he was um groping. Uh, groping so in the 1980s a female victim is believed to have told the metropolitan police she was assaulted in Savile's camper van in a bbc car park the police file cannot be located and the investigating officer is now dead yeah, and he'd make reference to this camper van that he had, but also a caravan that he had in Scarborough, so he wouldn't offend his mother, who lived in Scarborough, the Duchess, by bringing uh, women or girls um, to her house in Scarborough. So instead, he would kind of brag uh, in in the episode with Louis that he's got a caravan, and that that's the love shack. Yeah, the way he said about his mum was he wouldn't bring girls back then. It wasn't the case of his mum... Um it wasn't the case of his mum being controlling or not wanting him to find a partner. He, he very much painted it as the way she didn't want to lose her cushy life. She's like, she didn't want him to bring back one of these girls and then him like, kick her out of the house. Yeah. So he would keep it very separate. His keep any kind of girl he was in his in his mind seeing, and uh, his, then the Duchess completely separate. So yeah, for for a multimillionaire to have a caravan and a camper van, obviously not the most. Um, Imagine if you were of age and Savile had seduced you and you were female or male. Apparently he liked... Well, How did you manage to trip yourself up in such a way there? Go on. But I, you know, if, he, if, if a, a very famous, you know, one of arguably the most famous celebrities in the country wooed you, brought you back, and then all of a sudden it's a caravan or a camper van, it's not the illusion I was really had in mind, Jimmy. Well, none of it was. 
point is, yeah, I'd expect I, w- to... I want to know the point. <laughs> I would expect him to have some sort of mansion. And even his house in the Louis Ferrou uh, documentary is a shithole. <laughs> he hasn't got a cooker. Yeah, and we'll put in a little weird quote he said about cookers just here. I've got five places to live in, in England and not one of them have an oven because an oven means cooking. Cooking means a lady. A lady means staying longer than two hours and that would never do for me because I am a travelling pirate, right? And when all their various fathers, brothers, boyfriends, husbands come looking for me with a son off shotgun, a diesel drip and that's where I was. So... No cookers. Cookers is the first step towards brain damage. I've always tried to avoid putting anything in my mouth that's supposed to do me good. His whole relationship with with women, and he he'd go on to say, because it, he he appeared to me at first as someone who's very just asexual. He he didn't he seemed to be exactly what he wanted to be perceived as. I imagine. Yeah. A, car, a bigger than bigger than life character a bit of a cartoon there's also um, a lot of reports about his brother Johnny Savile who, who was his older brother who worked in Springfield Hospital as a recreation officer there were reports of um, sexual abuse and rape um, and he also would play on the fact that he knew his brother was a celebrity and yeah. he used that to try and woo women but um, fame. yeah he, he was uh, accused of a lot of similar things as Jimmy was and talking about the caravan you said he mentioned about where he would, that's where he would take women in his autobiography he claimed he had many sexual relations with women he said there have been trains and with apologies to the hit parade boats and planes I'm a member of the 40,000 foot club and bushes and fields corridors doorways floors chairs slag heaps desks and probably everything except the celebrated chandelier and ironing board 1988 Savile is appointed chairman of a task force set up to advise on governing the secure hospital Broadmoor which it, again is he's a just... fucking DJ I don't get it it's like <laughs> other than that what's he done he's had a few marathons why has he been hundreds gi- of marathons? Okay. Actually, Tom. Oh, sorry, standing up for Jimmy Savile. That's weird. But no. why, why, why is he qualified to be put in this position of power? Mm-hmm. What he's not trained in aftercare or and how to deal with criminals or deal with anyone who's in that situation or to deal with anyone at Broadmoor. So why has he been put in there to, to advise? It yeah, makes so, so Broadmoor, for those that don't know, this is a secure hospital that has traditionally housed some of the UK's most dangerous. Uh, Criminally, criminally insane yeah. uh, uh, offenders, uh, Bronson, the Yorkshire Ripper. Yeah, I mean Savile. There, there's a fa- well, we put a picture on Instagram up of yeah. uh, Savile uh, introducing Frank Bruno to uh, uh, Peter Sutcliffe, the yeah. Yorkshire Ripper, and so it was all a big joke. But what? I just don't understand why they're thinking that. Who? Who can we get on this? Let's get Savile on. And it. not just in on the task force, the bloody chairman of the task force. Yeah. So bizarre. So apparently in this as well, he's given room and board alongside the hospital so he can just basically live on the, the Broadmoor site and keys to various wings of the hospital. So he could either bring a girl back to either his camper van or Broadmoor. And now the camper van is starting to look bloody lovely. In 1990, Savile is knighted and also receives a papal knighthood from the Pope. Additional allegations come forward this year, including at least two complaints to police by women who were teenagers at the time. So that's the thing with, with, with Savile. A lot of these cases, you think, oh, why didn't the police just do this? Or why didn't this come forward? And why didn't they um, lead to any prosecutions? You have to think who he had on his side here. He had the Pope. He had Margaret Thatcher. He had Princess Di. He had Prince Charles. He had quite the character witnesses there who mm. you know thought very highly of him. So it, And he's raised millions upon millions for charity. It, it, it's like, it's a very... It's a very hard thing to unpick in terms of because people will will either don't want to believe you or they're just going to shut you up. It's Uh, going back to that like hidden in plain sight. Yeah. Um, It's too obvious to have possibly been. Yeah, like I've I've heard some American comedian saying before, look at him. (laughs) He's obviously obviously a nonce. But if you look at him, he looks like the kind of the godfather of pedophiles. Um, so, 26th of July 2006, Savile co-presents the final Top of the Pops, an occasion that gave rise to one of the allegations made to the police. It's in May 2007, Surrey Police question Savile over allegations of child sex abuse in the 1970s. Uh, the matter is referred to the Crown Prosecution Service, which advises that there is insufficient evidence to take further action. So as well, similar to what we, we talked about with the Louis Ferrou uh, documentary, I don't know if we mentioned this yet. So in one scene, he's happened to have obtained Louis 
Louis's home address and placed it on a on a table in front of Louis. And he says, I can get anything, me. And in this investigation with the police, um, he he basically kind of subtly threatens that he can get them dis uh, not disbarred, but demoted or removed from duty. He says, I'll see you at the old Bailey. You'll be there as a witness. He has a lot. He has a, yeah, he has a lot, lot of sway, and like we said before, a lot of friends in high places which he's able to lean on. And you know, like we said before, with him manipulating the policeman and when he was working in the grand in the dance halls, he's he's got that kind of sinister undertones you can kind of imply without saying too much as well which is yeah yeah um so in the same year um uh, an additional uh, allegation of sexual assault against Savile is raised which allegedly took place in Worthing in 1970 but it is dropped as the complainant is unwilling to cooperate so there you do hear a lot about this as well that things were settled outside a court um, it's intimidation as well. Like I said, a lot of these people uh, have been in hospitals or have been in Broadmoor uh, or have gone to schools for allegedly for, for difficult children. It's kind of the case studies where it's, it's the kind of cases where people may not believe the victims, which is horrible. But like yeah. that he's picked, he's handpicked the most vulnerable people yeah. whose stories are most likely not to be believed. Savile is also named during a 2008 police investigation into abuse at How de Ganen Children's Home in Jersey. So in March 2008, Savile begins legal proceedings against a newspaper that linked him to abuse at the Jersey's children's home. In 2009, Savile is interviewed under caution by Surrey police investigating an alleged indecent assault at Duncroft School. The Crown Prosecution Service advised there was insufficient evidence once again to take any further action. This was the year of the last offence recorded by the current investigation. So you see that a lot with this case, if you read up on it, it, they can't say for definite how many counts there are. They can say how many counts there are in terms of things that have been proven or been uh, yeah. put against him, but the amount of people that they believe who hasn't come forward Just about stayed it, silent. which could be, they, they said it could even be five times the amount, yeah. which is already over 200 cases. It's absolutely sickening. <clears throat> uh, police have given another example of fence dating from this year in which a 43-year-old woman was sexually assaulted by Savile on a train journey between Leeds and London. It's the 29th of October, Jimmy Savile dies. Jimmy Savile is found dead at his home in the Round Hay district of Leeds. Crowds gather to the rafters as Savile's funeral takes place and his hearse drives through Leeds. There's, if you see, the, there's a video footage of this. It's just the streets, the streets are, are packed. Yeah, packed. They, they look to him as a, kind of the celebrity of their place. They're very proud of him. He's buried the following month in the seaside town of Scarborough. So when you see um, the the funeral uh, or the ceremony taking place, he's in a, a gold lacquered uh, coffin. Um, and his his last wishes to be buried with his two books from uh, the appearances he made on This Is Your Life, as well as two Havana cigars um, and a third one, which was his final, uh, alleged to have been his final smoked cigar. Yeah, the, it also he was specified that he wanted his coffin to be inclined at 45 degrees, so to, to fulfill his wish to see the sea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he was buried with a lot of jewellery, um, and, and for that reason he had requested that concrete uh, would be poured over the top of the gold coffin to prevent um, any potential grave diggers. The thing is, though, Rob grave diggers, grave um, robbers, ro grave robbers. Think about this: uh, wanting to see the sea. Um, number one, the underground. Number two, it covered in concrete. You're not seeing much, Jimmy. To be fair, just, he died two days before his 85th birthday. He had been in hospital with with pneumonia. And it, but his death was ruled as not being suspicious. Yeah, he'd had a in a, a, a few years prior to this, he'd, he'd had a triple bypass operation on his heart, so his health was said to have been in a kind of shaky state uh, for the final years of his life. And uh, yeah, 2011, as well as Jimmy dying, the scandal then officially breaks and becomes kind of public, uh, pub, kind of public knowledge. So when Jimmy was going down in the box, the uh, Pandora's box of Jimmy's life was open. That's good, Squishy. <laughs> so um, the scandal officially breaks in 2011, and since Jimmy's death, a string of official inquiries are launched into his offending at hospitals, schools, and at the BBC. Um, no mention of the caravan. Um, an independent inquiry found that Savile abused 60 people, including at least 33 patients aged from 5 to 75 at Leeds General Infirmary, and these numbers would 
rapidly rise. So in early November of 2011, a Newsnight investigation into Savile begins. Reporter Liz McCain and researcher Hannah Livingston make contact with former Duncroft pupils. So 11th of November, and if there's one thing we've learned from the last few episodes, don't run a tribute show until you know the full story. A BBC tribute programme is aired on BBC One called Jimmy Savile As It Happened. Another tribute show is aired a month later with the discomforting title of Sir Jimmy Savile at the BBC. How's about that then? How's about that then? I understand that they want to get, they've seen the, you know, the, the crowds gather at his funeral. They know that this is huge, well, it's the biggest headline news. But October is, so he dies then and then the scandal starts breaking. Yeah. That's long enough. It's like WWE with Chris Benoit, you could forgive them because it was so quick after and possibly didn't hear it. And I wasn't totally there with forgiving them. Okay, but then a month. Yeah. It's like, there's enough to be like, or even communicate, because that's BBC and that's News, yeah. Newsnight is BBC as well. Yeah, and that's 60 people that have come forward. Yeah. Could be, you know, he's passed away, he can't defend himself. The 60 people, though, that's still that's still a lot of... Um... Well, one of the big things was the stories were so similar to one another without them ever talking to one, to each other. All these yeah. reports coming in, they all followed a similar pattern. Yeah, so, so they've, um, they've, you know, not followed our advice. Wait until you have all the information before you run a tribute show. It's hard to follow advice when we're giving it afterwards, though. Yeah, well, that's the thing about afterwards advice. Um, sometimes it's not always there. <laughs> That's why yeah, your book, What They Should Have Done. Yeah. Um, about his didn't histor sell. historical events. Um, yeah. Yeah. It didn't sell. The Newsnight editor Peter Rippon emails reporter Marion Jones telling him to stop working on other elements of the investigation because it's not strong enough without confirmation of the CPS angle and saying that he, Rippon, will pull the editing. Jones emails himself the red flag email in which he sets out what he sees as the consequences for the BBC if the story does not run. So essentially this kind of lines up with them. Shall they do the tribute show? Shall they publish these actual, um, you know, allegations that have come forward, the inquest? Um, there's a lot of kind of, and a lot of fingers will be pointed at the BBC for, you know, potentially hiding a lot of this information. Exactly, yeah. And the thing is, it's like the BBC here have to admit and break, break the story that they've been paying and uh, putting this, you know, this renowned paedophile on television for all these years. And it's kind of one of those things where a lot of people will react to it like, how didn't they know that? So it's, they, they'll feel conflicted anyway about wanting to expose themselves for their wrongdoing yeah. whilst exposing his wrongdoing. And potentially then, if, if this is exposed, who else is going down? Yeah, we'll, we'll get we'll, to that. Yeah. So the 5th of December 2011, Surrey police confirmed that they investigated a historic allegation of indecent assault alleged to have occurred at a children's home in Staines in the 1970s. And they claim that they referred this investigation to the Crown Prosecution Service. So again, lots of fingers being pointed here, lots of different people blaming one another, um, and you know, it's only gonna get worse. So the 9th of December, the Crown Prosecution Service informs Jones it's decided not to prosecute Savile because of the lack of evidence and not because he was old or infirm. Rippon and Jones meet, and Jones tells Rippon that he accepts the decision that he is not to pursue the story anymore. And that's just bizarre. They've, they've only had the 60 people come forward and and, uh, and make these allegations, but they, they don't want to pursue the investigation further. I mean, I don't think you should ever not prosecute someone because they're old or infirm. Well, yeah. Anyway. Oh, but yeah, but he is old, though. Oh, yeah, good point. Let's just... Let's burn the bucks. <laughs> So the 8th of January 2012, the Sunday Mirror reports that the Newsnight investigation was axed and refers to a clash with the Fix It tribute show. So it's been unearthed that they are essentially trying to drop this investigation into Savile and the Sunday Mirror are having none of it. No, yeah, that's, I mean, that's like we said, the BBC are being worried if they're going to, I think that's obviously going to be playing in their mind if they, they've been doing all the show and even having the tribute shows and whatnot, they're immediately going to admit in their fault and the investigations, it just, yeah, it seems absolutely bizarre. Yeah, and they're essentially now trying to defend the fact that they ran a tribute show whilst this was all going on. So it's, it's, a, it's a mess. So on the 7th of September, the BBC receives a letter from ITV giving notice of the exposure documentary on Savile's sex abuse allegations and posing questions. So yeah, so the, the, the ITV are expecting some sort of a cease and desist or um, response at least from the BBC. They do not hear back from them. And... Uh, on the 3rd of October, the ITV exposure programme on Savile is broadcast. 
hats off to ITV because they have they have they have done things like the Epstein uh, documentary and the Prince Andrew ones, things that the BBC would never touch. So just, just a little nod, little nod to ITV there. Nod. So on the eighth of October, the BBC Director General George Entwistle appears. Not, not, not a whistleblower, appears on the Today programme. McCain emails M. Whistle to share her displeasure with the handling of the Newsnight Savile story and pointing out inaccuracy in an all-staff email. Ouch. M. Whistle asks Ken McQuarrie, BBC Scotland director, to investigate the circumstances in which the Newsnight investigation was dropped. So that brings us to the 12th of October 2012. The Sun reports that David Nicholson, who was a director on the Jim Will Fix It show, claimed to have caught Savile having sex with a girl in his dressing room, but was laughed away when he voiced concerns. So essentially he walked in on Savile, caught him with an underage girl, and Savile kind of turns it into a joke. And a woman tells BBC Radio Leeds that Savile also abused a 12-year-old girl during a visit to a children's home in the 1970s where she was also a resident. Police say they have now received 340 potential lines of inquiry, which is just staggering. And this is um, almost a year after his death. 340 people have come forward. So the 13th of October 2012, so Pace is now gathering on all the people coming forward uh, with with different accusations on Savile. And again, like Tom said, a a nod to ITV because they have kind of snowballed this now. So the Department of Health says it will investigate the appointment of Savile in 1988 as a chairman of a task force to advise on governing at Broadmoor. Meanwhile, police say allegations are likely to span six decades from 1959 to 2006, which that in itself, some people don't even live that long. Commander Peter Spindler says he estimates the number of likely victims to be about 60. 12 complaints of sexual offences have been made public to the police and 14 task forces are involved. Yeah, in 2012 as well, Richard Harrison, a long-serving psychiatric nurse at Broadmoor Hospital, said that Savile had long been regarded by staff as a man with a severe personality disorder and a liking for children. Another nurse, Bob Allen, considered Savile to be a psychopath, stating a lot of st- a lot of the staff said he should be behind bars. Um, and they, they had reported him to authorities beforehand for his, his, his conduct with people, but again, it was ignored. I mean, the people who are trained in yeah. within this are saying what, what they believe him to be, though he was still in a situation, situation of power over them. So the 22nd of October 2012, a panorama special is aired on the BBC based on the Savile allegations. So finally, they decide that, you know what, ITV have kind of called us out here, we're going to... We're yeah, gonna, this is our response. Yeah, they've been backed into a corner, it feels. It's not a case of they were going to do it anyway. Yeah, they had to do it. The 23rd of October, Entwistle appears before the Commons Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee. At a very similar time, the BBC asks Dame Janet Smith to investigate the culture and practices of all at the BBC in the decades that Savile worked there. Former pop star Gary Glitter is the first person to be arrested in connection with the police investigation into the Jimmy Savile abuse claims. Glitter, whose real name is Paul Gadd, <laughs> is released on bail until mid-December after being questioned at a London police station. It also emerges that Savile's former house in the Scottish Highlands has been vandalised and painted with abusive slogans. Yeah, so the thing about Gary Glitter, there's a really eye-opening interview with uh, with Savile two years before Savile died on on um, Gary Glitter because I think before this particular date, accusations had come out about Gary in... Um, Thailand, Thailand, or Cambodia, or somewhere in the in kind of Southeast Asia, um, and it's really uncomfortable listening because Savile is talking about Gary as if oh, it's just harmless. It's just a few things on his hard drive. Well, when you see there's there's that famous footage of of Gary Glitter on the show with Jimmy Savile. Yeah, oh. they both sit between young girls, put the arms around them, and they, they look like they look like kids in the candy store. It's horrible. Yeah, and the girls look absolutely terrified. Um, but we'll play a little bit of uh, of this audio uh, when Savile was questioned about uh, Gary Glitter because it is disturbing. All he did was to set his computer into the PC world to get repaired. And then went into the hard drive, saw all his dodgy pictures, uh, and told the police. And the police then, oh, we've got a famous person. Oh my goodness, yeah, we love them. But not sold him, not tried to sell him, not tried to show him in public or anything like that. It would. It would for his own gratification, whether it was right or wrong, uh, uh, is, is of course it's up to another person. But 
but they didn't do anything wrong, but they are then demonized. Uh, and of course, if you ever said to a couple of us, go to get the door, we all go, they just sat at home watching these dodgy, dodgy films. So the 1st of November 2012, Freddie Starr is arrested. So entertainer Freddie Starr is arrested in the police inquiry into sex abuse claims against Jimmy Savile. Um, he denied claims that he groped a girl of the age of 14 while in a room with Savile. Meanwhile, it is announced that the review into Newsnight's dropping of an investigation into Savile will be reported later in the year. So 10th of November, Entwistle resigns as Director General of the BBC. So the 12th of December 2012, police state that the number of potential abuse victims um, at the hands of the late Jimmy Savile has reached 450, which is just absolutely staggering. Officers from Operation Utree, which is part of the investigation into the offences, say that they have recorded 199 crimes allegedly committed by Savile in 17 police force areas. The investigation is also looking into sexual offences allegedly committed by others and Commander Peter Spindler says that a total of 589 alleged victims have now come forward. So as we said earlier, this, this is people that have come forward. A lot of people obviously don't come forward and, and you know are still terrified of them and yeah. don't come forward. Well, so a lot of people still haven't come forward as well. Yeah, exactly. So, so these, these numbers are people who have come forward so with the numbers they you know they predict are much much higher than that um the other thing about operation new tree i was like what's the reason for the name but it's just a completely random word they picked because it's completely unassociated to anything you is it you tree because now it holds such a kind of weight to that phrase doesn't it yeah do you reckon do you reckon they pick you tree because it's not really a common tree as well because mm. imagine if it was called like chestnut tree i imagine the sales of chestnut trees would go down such a, it's such a point that does not matter whatsoever but um, I don't know who's buying chestnut trees to be fair just, wow. get, just pick up a conker I've always said that um, anyway should we get on with the case let's do it so in 2013 the 11th of January Scotland Yard labels Savile as a prolific predatory sex offender after its investigation reveals 214 criminal offences across 28 police forces between 1955 and 2009 its report, giving victims a voice, found that 73% of his victims were children and that the allegations of abuse spanned 14 medical establishments. A report is published detailing abuse by Jimmy Savile spanning five decades. Police say they have recorded 214 offences, including 34 rapes against victims as young as eight. The joint report by the Metropolitan Police and the NSPCC finds the offences took place at many locations, including hospitals and a hospice. The Crown Prosecution Service apologises for missing the opportunity to prosecute Savile in 2009 while he was still alive. That's insane. Yeah, I mean, those numbers just are, are baffling, but just that's the thing that I think a lot of people find very frustrating about this is the fact that there was opportunities multiple, there multiple, multiple opportunities. where they could punish him whilst he's still alive, where you, you can't help but feel that he... Well, he died. He got away with it. He died a hero because he died. He went down the street. He got the got the funeral of his dreams, the send off of his dreams. Got the forty five degree fucking angle of the sea. But that's that's what I find. Yeah, it, that's what I think a lot of people find very frustrating about this whole case is there are so many red flags. Yeah. Uh, I mean, even now there's so much anger. That yeah, he, definitely that he got away with it. Um, so many red flags. You thought you'd be at, in at Old Trafford if you're looking around. He's a big Leeds man. Yeah, but red Ben. Yeah, Leeds wear white. Yeah, big rivals. I don't think he'd be seen dead there, or would he? Let's find out. How are we going to find out? So the second of June, two thousand and fourteen, the children's charity NSPCC research uh, that they were doing for the BBC Panorama into Savile um, confirms that there have been at least five hundred reports of abuse by Savile. So following all these allegations, his headstone was subsequently removed, and his body was reported to be exhumed and cremated. Um, the, you know, obviously the fear of vandalism or people going there and... yeah do you know what it said on the headstone as well um I don't actually Ben it was good while it lasted Ugh. yeah uh, do you know what Spike Milligan said on it I told you I was ill a bit of light, bit of light relief there um but he, I'm not associating Spike Milligan with Jimmy Savile so in terms of looking for any kind of clear motive or reason why Savile um, chose to conduct himself in the way that he did, um, you know, there are lots of, it's, it's open to um, uh, speculation. Um, 
obviously the relationship with the Duchess, his mother, was was one that was um, had a lot of question marks around it. So, I mean, again, to go back to the Louis Ferru uh, documentary, they're in the Scarborough um, house that he had bu- uh, bought for his mother. And Savile claimed that he, um, you know, he, he he wouldn't openly admit that he loved his mother, but he said we were very friendly. Um, and he, he would still, in the final years of his life, get her all of her possessions dry cleaned and 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 protected um, to preserve them. So it's very similar to kind of Ed Gang, Norman Bates, kind of obsession with his mother, like you said, dry cleaning their clothes, keeping the room immaculate. So it seems to be a very unhealthy relationship that happened there. Um, an auction of Savile's possessions was conducted at the Royal Armouries Museum in Leeds on the 30th of July 2012, with all of the proceeds going to charity. His silver Rolls Royce convertible was sold for £130,000 to an internet bidder. At the time of his passing, Savile's net worth was said to have been £4.1 million. So as we stated before, there's lots of whispers and lots of kind of people talking about Savile and what they heard about him. One of these famous people were Johnny Lydon, who is Johnny Rotten from the Sex Pistols. I just want to make a film of it on film. I'd like to kill Jimmy Savile. I think he's a hypocrite. When I write... I bet he's into all kinds of seediness that we all know about but they're not allowed to talk about. I know some (laughs) rumours. I bet none of this will be allowed out. I shouldn't imagine libelous stuff will be out of that. Nothing I said is libel. In October of 2014, Lydon expanded on his original quote by saying, By killed, I meant locking him up and stopping him assaulting young children. I'm disgusted at the media pretending they weren't aware. So, yeah, it just goes to show that, I mean, there's clear <coughs> whispers and, and, you know, the BBC have gone on to kind of not, not air anything he did again, he's done again, and he top of the pops, and never do any repeats, yeah. similar to Chris Benoit. They're completely wiping him out of their, their history. Yeah, I mean, it, because he was such an out there character as well, he was so quirky and so different. Um, it was quite easy, obviously, for all this controversy to, to be turned to be kind of made light and turned into a bit of a joke. But there was still, obviously, a lot of question marks over people that knew at the time and who were in on it. And essentially, they were trying to sweep it under the rug as if nothing happened. So this launched a full investigation into, um, you know, a, a potentially a child sex trafficking network. Um, and there are some witnesses that were also, um, you know, victims of this in the various documentaries we've watched, and it is absolutely harrowing to hear um, yeah. what went down. <clears throat> so, as Tom mentioned, the BBC did try and delete Savile completely from uh, their their archives, um, to the point where even and uh, an old episode of Only Fools and Horses um, had a scene deleted for a mention of Jimmy Savile's name, which is which is quite the the scene itself is funny, but obviously it was deleted, so we'll, we'll pop it up. It's funny, it's Trigger. Oh, if it's Trigger, then let's get it out. Yeah. Someone else has stepped out. It's a woman. Tall, slender, long blonde hair. Fingers covered in rings of ruby and gold. Bracelets adorn the wrists. You know who that is, don't you? Sounds like Jimmy Savile. <laughs> Jimmy Savile. That is our mother. <laughs> Jimmy Savile. Jim can't fix it. Uh, so a man named John Barry, who's 61, was forced to quit his job. Are you crying or laughing? I'm laughing. Okay. So a man named John Barry, who was 61, was forced to quit his job as a Jimmy Savile lookalike after the sex abuse scandal about the deceased DJ emerged. So I remember at the time that the scandal broke, um, there's a Weatherspoons pub uh, in the uh, city centre of Cambridge, where me and Tom are both from, um, and it's called The Regal. And basically everyone goes there at the kind of end of the night or the beginning of the night. In any case, all I heard one night this is going back, what, what, 2011, so going back 10 years. And all I heard was just a eruption in the room, and it, it turns out that a guy had tried to come into the Regal in Jimmy Savile fancy dress, and it didn't go down. It was kind of mixed reaction. Half the room found it hilarious. The other half of the room wanted to pulverize him. Um, so uh, one of the stars of the recent Netflix hit series, The Tiger King, uh, Carol Baskin, uh, was tricked into uh, performing a cameo video wishing all the best to her huge fans, Rolf Harris and Jimmy Savile. Um, as well as this, Billy Ray Cyrus was tricked into tweeting to huge fan, Grandpa Jimmy Savile. 
And that was the case of Jimmy Savile. And that therein marks the halfway point of the series free. The series free. If you enjoyed the episode, please give us a like and a subscribe. And if you're hungry for more content on our Patreon, we have lots of minisodes on there covering different cases. Um, we also have our brand new shiny merchandise store, uh, which is www.icmap.store. Icmap.store. And like we always say... Oh, we say this all the time. Keep doing what you're doing. Unless it's, you know, unless it's doing stuff like... Mm. Yeah, we're not gonna even. Yeah, it's not. See ya. See ya. See ya.